Okay, great. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our last uh, public health um, conversation uh, with Dr. Santora of the, of the school year. I just want to, my name is Mary Jane Burke. Thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us today. And I want to express my appreciation for all the efforts throughout this amazing, amazing school year. Um, Marin County has so much to be proud of and it's because of the commitment of uh, the entire community and most especially um, our relationship with Dr. Santora and uh, Dr. Willis and the amazing educators that serve the students in the public, private, independent, and parochial schools. So just as a reminder, this, is, uh, this session will be uh, recorded and available on the Marin County Office of Education website uh, by tomorrow. So that's number one. Um, number two, this is being simultaneously broadcast in Spanish. Thank you to Maria, who is our interpreter today. And I'm gonna ask Araceli uh, Nunez right now to give some instructions to those who wanna know how to be sure that you can hear that translation. Araceli, thank you. Esta actualización de salud pública para la comunidad escolar se está grabando y estará disponible en nuestro sitio web de MCOE dentro de las 24 horas. Este webinar también se transmite simultáneamente en español. Si desea seguir escuchando en español, haga clic en el botón de interpretación del idioma que parece un globo teraqueo. Gracias a María Padilla, quien es nuestra intérprete hoy. Finalmente, Gracias por enviar sus preguntas con anticipación. También puede hacer preguntas en el chat y intentaremos que se las responda. Se combinarán todas las preguntas que surjan y que sean de naturaleza similar. Gracias. Great. Thank you so much, Araceli. Appreciate it. Uh, so just before I pass this on to Dr. Santora, I just want everyone to sit a little taller as I review this information with you that by the end of this school year, 95% uh, of our schools had uh, their students back in school full-time five days a week. Um, we had 175 days ultimately of in-person instruction. Um, that, that equaled uh, close to 3 million student days. It was actually 2,805,000. Um, there were 19 suspected in-school transmissions. None of those were uh, student uh, to adult. Um, and in the end of the story, we were able to do what we needed to do to ensure that our students and our staff were safely able to return to school. So we have so much to be proud of. So thank you all again, and I'll pass this on to Dr. Dr. Santora. Thank you, Mary Jane. And I just want to express my gratitude to everyone on this call and all of the extended teams of families and volunteers and educators and staff um, for achieving that success. And that is because we work together. We are focused on our kids um, from the beginning, from that first day. And we navigated to lead the nation and um, safely returning students to school where um, they can thrive. And I'm just so so proud of our work together. It is my proudest achievement of in our COVID-19 emergency response is um, Ring County. We have great we have great numbers across the board, but um, having our students return to school safely is um, definitely my proudest achievement. So thank you all. You can jump ahead. Unfortunately, Dr. Willis cannot be with us today, but I, he would I'm sure echo my gratitude to everyone as well. And I just wanna publicly thank Dr. Willis. His leadership has been tremendous and his determination and vision is why we have excelled across every metric um, where it relates to protecting our community and saving lives from this COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you, Dr. Willis. And um, so here we are, you will see that we are now at the a long tail end of our, after our third wave of COVID-19 and our pandemic. And this is driven primarily by vaccinations. Our success in vaccinations has resulted in a, a rapid decline of both hospitalizations and in deaths related to COVID-19. And it's what's allowed us to 
um, reopen the state, that which happened on the 15th. So you can jump ahead. So what was it like on reopening day? Uh, again, this is something where we're so proud and this is all of the partnerships have been working together across every sector. Oh, I can't see. There was, that was weird, um, to achieve this success. We, we had no one in the hospital on, on Tuesday. We had no deaths due to COVID in the past month. And we have very low daily case counts. Um, there were days we were seeing 60 cases of COVID-19 a day. And in the past, um, I'd say the past week, we've been having between three to five new cases a day. Just a reminder that COVID is out there, but it is not at the same rates that we saw before. And as I mentioned, our vaccination um, is really the key to our success in ending this pandemic. And we have nearly 90% of eligible residents have received at least one dose and 80% of eligible residents are fully vaccinated. So again, we are excelling in vaccination and that is um, ensures our safer, safer reopening. We still are in a pandemic, there still are risks, but um, this data really can reassure you that it is time to re reopen our community. You can jump ahead. So where are we now? Um, the blueprint for a safer economy, which many of us spent many times on the state website has now been officially retired. All sectors are open without capacity limits or social distancing requirements. There is an exception um, to mega events. So large um, concerts like Bottle Rock, anything that has over 5,000 folks, there are more specific rules around that. We have rescinded our pandemic orders. Um, as you may recall that Marin County and other Bay areas led the nation and in initiating our own public health orders. Those have all been rescinded except for isolation and quarantine. And that is um, a requirement that anyone who is diagnosed with COVID-19 must isolate. And anyone exposed to COVID-19, if they are unvaccinated, must quarantine. And these are um, the only remaining orders in our county, um, except the state order, um, which is now just limited, as I mentioned, to mega events, um, face coverings, and specific set specific settings, which do include our schools, childcare, and youth settings. You can jump ahead. So we still, um, we have not yet started in the new year and there are schools that are still in session. So we are still required to follow the guidance for both K through 12 and for childcare, as well as there's specific parts of the guidance that are applicable to day camps under the, the rec, rec the recommendations and order of the state. And that's just, again, this is one of the reservoirs of uh, unvaccinated populations is in our under 12 group. So there's um, a, a reason why there's still more strict rules in this space because of the vulnerability of this particular sector where we have a higher percentage of individuals who cannot get vaccinated. But the good news is when outdoors, everyone can go mask free. And our only point on this is that just to support those who are not yet ready to go mask free outdoors. It's, we've all many, we've all gotten used to wearing masks in, in all settings, both indoors and outdoors. And so change, some people are already ready to burn every mask they have. And some people still aren't ready to even to take their mask off when they're outdoors. So just support everyone in their choice. Um, but your kids can be outside and playing at, at camp outside without a mask. So. That is good news for all of us today. As I said, I'm very proud of many things. This is another one that we're really proud of because it reflects our partnership with our schools and the County Office of Education. We recognize the critical importance of returning um, to our new normal um, by having adolescents vaccinated in our community. And so we partnered um, with the schools to offer school-based Vaccination. We also partnered with Safeway and Curative and other entities to be on site at different school based locations to ensure all students in Marin had access to vaccination. And what you can see again um, is that Marin County absolutely led not only the region, but the state in achieving high vaccination rates for the 12 to 17 year old. And this data is actually a little bit old. It's at 73%. We're now over, um, I think we're at 78% of um, the 12 to 17 year olds have received at least one dose of vaccination. So um, again, this just re reflects our, our radical collaboration as Dr. Willis says and our partnerships with the schools and staff to make vaccine available. So you can jump ahead. Mary Jane, do you wanna jump in on this one or you want me to start? This uh, essentially and you know provides 
what happened this school year. I mentioned some of the data points. I want you all to be aware that we will be, um, as we start next school year, we'll continue to keep this information um, you know, up to date. So we'll sort of take a snapshot of this to give us a sense of what happened, what happened this year. And so that's the slide, sorry, to the left with the green dots and then to the right, um, this is a chart you're very familiar with. As you can see, it, it's currently in yellow because we're in the yellow tier um, and provides information as well. Uh, the data that we've collected has been, I think, probably one of the more valuable things that we've done over time uh, in that we were able to look at that uh, to see how things were going. Um, and, you know, in addition, each and every situation where there, there was a suspected in-school transmission, um, the, our public health partners, along with school partners, actually went through the steps to better understand what did happen so that we are able to um, reinforce uh, whatever the practices are that, that may have been not in play, perhaps, uh, that led to the transmission. So we'll continue to do that. So no, other than that, Lisa, I, I don't have anything else to add. So you will not see this updated during the summer. We will be continuing to monitor if there are, are cases in summer camps and in the school setting, but this will not be updated. We will um, post the new dashboard when the new school year starts. So we are excited about that. And many of you did um, see or hear or read about an outbreak in one of our local schools. And I just wanted to share some information about this and what we, what we learned from this. Um, so we had 27 cases um, with this uh, with this particular outbreak. There are two different clusters or groups that um, we investigated. Um, the index cases were symptomatic unvaccinated persons, some eligible and, and eligible for vaccine and, and non-eligible for vaccine groups. So again, this really shows the protection offered by vaccination. There is high levels of social contact. There's multiple sports teams and sleepovers and gatherings, which were a primary driver. It was not the school environment that was a primary driver. We were really, we visited the school and were very impressed with all of the measures they had in place um, to create a, um, the safest possible environment. So um, the school had a lot to be proud of, but um, this was at the end of the year when things really started reopening. As, as you drove past schools on the weekends, you saw lots of people engaging in sports and people beginning to gather. And many of us who have kids, um, school-age children, are mixed, are having mixed gatherings. There's um, not. A, I have two kids under the age of 12, so they can't be vaccinated. So when we do have gatherings with other households, um, many are off, often mixed because the full household cannot be get vaccinated primarily due to age. Uh, we saw household transmission as a, another key driver. So it wasn't school-based transmission as the key driver. It was household and close contacts outside of school that were key drivers. And it was primarily to unvaccinated parents and siblings. But it's important to note that there were two breakthrough cases, people that were vaccinated and who did test positive for COVID-19. The good news about all of this is no one was hospitalized. We didn't have um, any severe illness, um, in, which could have been possible um, for individuals who, um, if they were not vaccinated. Um, most notably, and I don't know if this received a lot of attention um, in the news or any coverage, but we, had, we partnered with the state on this outbreak because it was one of the larger outbreaks um, that had a connection to a school. And we identified that we had the Delta variant um, that was previously known as the India variant, which has a higher level of transmissibility um, so it's just more um, infectious by the nature of the variant itself, the mutation itself. And just yesterday it was announced as a variant of concern. And again, Marin County has been leading the state in submissions of whole genome sequencing. So every time we have breakthrough cases or hospitalizations, we've been partnering with our healthcare partners to submit them to the state for sequencing. And so we recognized um, we were kind of the, the canary in the coal mine for identifying that um, this Delta variant has established itself in the state of California. And so we really are proud of that partnership. Um, so the, the lessons to be learned here is if you're eligible for vaccination, get vaccinated. It's the, the probably the single um, most important protective factor as we move um, up during the summer when there is a variant that is, um, is transmissible. And we will be gathering it. This is not, the lesson learned is not 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 together. We are going to gather with other households. That's what this summer is about. Um, as I mentioned, not every household will be able to be fully vaccinated. The key there is to identify if you have symptoms. 
um, and this is probably, the, this is the point that I want to end on with this slide before going to the next slide is um, any symptom you have, especially if you're unvaccinated, if it is a COVID-19 symptom like sore throat, um, new cough, um, losing your smell, do not go to work, uh, do not go to school, do not go to camp, do not pass go, go and get tested. Testing is very readily available. You'll have results within the day and it's better to um, stay at home for the day or two while you wait results and um, not to potentially transmit um, COVID-19 into an environment um, like, a, like a camp or a summer school. So the key on this is listen to your symptoms and get tested and don't just attribute a sore throat to uh, sinus infection or allergies. Get tested, especially if you're unvaccinated. Getting up ahead. So school's out for summer, but not for everyone. We are gonna be having office hours. Um, we are in the process of building our, our teams. We're hiring five new nurses, which is really exciting in public health. And we're gonna be training many of them and cross-training them in schools. So um, you may see some new faces on our, on our public health liaison calls. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but our school teams will be available every Thursday. It's not a train anymore. We're just calling it office hours. So if there's any consultation that's needed, um, we're available every day though. You can still email us or call us every single day, um, but we are going to be available for camps. We are expecting outbreaks in camps. Um, we are expecting outbreaks, um, hopefully smaller outbreaks, um, because again, there'll be unvaccinated children who are going to be carpooling together, who are going to be playing outdoors and indoors. And it is to be expected that there will be outbreaks over the summer just because of the nature of our reopening and the fact that there is still COVID-19 in our community. Jump ahead. In. So the next big gathering after this gathering will be on August 17th. So um, many people are going to go off and enjoy their summers, but we will um, come back at this time. We are confident that the state will have its updated guidance. What we're seeing is the state is falling in line with the Centers for Disease Control now. Um, and so that's what we expect to see. The CDC has um, updated its summer camp guidance, but has not yet updated its school guidance for the next school year. What is happening right now is that we're watching. We're in the middle of a large experiment as the entire nation reopens. And we're gonna see how with the, the levels of vaccination, um, the vaccination rates that we currently have, what is the COVID-19 activity looking like? And that will really determine how strict or restrictive um, the recommendations will be coming from the Centers for Disease Control. And unlike, um, unlike previously, we expect the state to align with the CDC. That's what you're seeing now with the guidance around face coverings is the state is now aligning with the CDC. And if you go to the CDC sites and seek more information, um, most of the links will start directing you back to the, um, sorry, if you go to the state site, most of the links will start directing you back to the Centers for Disease Control. So look forward to seeing many of you on August 17th. So what we do know, so that's on the 17th, we'll know a lot more. Uh, we're gonna just do some tea leaf reading for you now. Um, we do know that we, there will be an expectation that schools have a COVID safety plan. Um, a lot of it's really just gonna be focused on indoor face coverings, making sure people practice their personal protective behaviors like hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. Most importantly, students and staff staying at home when they have any symptoms that might be con consistent with COVID-19. And so, but we're not expecting the same rigor of not having people on campus and the, the kind of the fomite avoidance uh, or you know, not you know, all of the, the high levels of disinfection that we were doing at the beginning of the return to school. Um, those will all be relaxed because we, we have learned that COVID-19 is not transmitted by fomites or by surfaces. Uh, we, um, we see that the outdoor congregation is, um, is safer, being outdoors is relatively safer. So um, the concern around all the school lines, um, we had very controlled entries and ingress and egress into the schools and we're gonna, we expect to see a relaxation around that. But just our core principles, really stay at home when you're sick, wash your hands, cover your face when you're indoors. Jump ahead. So I'm really excited. We're going to go from a 30, our plan, and this is pending. Um, we're going to, waiting to see, we're going to be going from our 30 point guidance to a 10 point guidance. So um, really getting back to the basics is going to make it a lot easier for us to update it. Uh, I can't say it enough. Again, if you look on that left hand side is staying at home when you're sick. Um, we'll still have our exposure protocols in place. We are expecting that we will identify kids who test positive for COVID-19 and were in school when they during their infectious period. If you remember, remember when I described the outbreak we investigated, they're both asymptomatic and symptomatic kids. And so kids, again, are less likely to have um, 
very long lasting symptoms of COVID and are much more likely to be asymptomatic. So that, that's what we're prepared for. Um, the, I say this all the time, COVID hates the outdoors. So consistently um, just optimizing our time in the outdoors areas and the schools have already, most of the schools have already worked to implement um, improved ventilation systems, which will be really helpful for us as we move into wildfire seasons. Uh, we anticipate, Kids can eat, doors, uh, eat indoors and take their masks down, but trying to limit the amount of times they have indoors. And we're gonna be waiting to see what the school will say around those outdoor playgrounds. So in summer camps right now, kids can be outdoors and, and mixing and playing outdoors without their mask on. We're still waiting to see what that looks like when the state comes up with its updated guidance. Um, base covering for everyone indoors, unless we see something different. Um, some of the conversations is around, um, we know that elementary schools will, will not be vaccinated. The students will not be vaccinated going into the fall. Um, we do not have a timeline for vaccination of the five to, to 11 year old population at all. It may occur in, in, in the late, late winter, early spring of next year, but we don't have information about that yet. Um, so it, it is possible there might be different recommendations for a secondary school that has high levels of vaccination and what's allowable around face coverings versus um, primary school or elementary school where we know the majority of students will not be vaccinated. Um, public health is recommending that all visitors and volunteers and contractors who are working directly with students should be fully vaccinated. We recommend anyone, everyone in the county should be fully vaccinated unless they have a specific um, allergy to some a component of this vaccination. We know that sports, as I described in our outbreak, sports and um, plays increases the risk of COVID-19 transmission just because of the contact and exhaling a lot. And people also exhale a lot when they sing or play music. So those are um, areas that will be anticipate get more guidance from the state. Um, I was hoping it would be released before this meeting, but it didn't come yet. So we'll we'll provide you an update on. Um, August 15th around music and sports. And we are, as, as I mentioned, we'll be in communication with the schools throughout the summer. I know that there's, um, remember band, um, band camp starts early in the, or in, earlier in the summer than the start of the school year. So we'll be in communication with all the schools um, once any guidance comes out from the state that relates to school-based activities. And then we're just changing the names. We describe public health liaisons. Um, we're now gonna call them public health and safety liaisons. We, this is one of the, I think the silver linings that of, or the lessons learned um, from the COVID response is really strengthening our relationships with the schools and having staff that are trained um, to, to connect with public health and really thinking around all hazards. As I've mentioned, wildfires already once. Um, we're sh we have other safety um, issues that are shared between schools and public health. And we see this as an opportunity to maintain that relationship that we developed in during the COVID response. Anything you wanna add here, Mary Jane? Oh, I think, you know, the main thing is that we're going to know more, um, but wanted to give you as much information as we had. There are several questions. What if everyone's fully vaccinated? Do they still have to wear face covering indoors? And that is yes. Yes. A hard yes at this point. Um, so if everybody would just be reminded. So we, and obviously once the message, you know, we have the message, we want it to be as crisp and clear as, as possible. Um, Lisa, a question came up that we might be able to take right here. Do we see um, anything changing related to the transportation guidance in terms of capacity of buses? Yes. Okay. So, so, that, go ahead. so we'll, review, we'll update the transportation guidance because the capacity levels have, we had restricted capacity. We actually led in identifying a capacity because we, to ensure transportation for our students to schools, but there are no longer capacity limits on um, buses. It's the, the only rule on the bus is that everyone needs to wear a mask on a bus. So all forms of public transit, people need to wear masks. So we don't have capacity limits. We'd still recommend that the windows stay down. As I mentioned, COVID hates the air. So we'd recommend the windows be down. Uh, but there are no longer any restrictions on transportation except wearing face coverings. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you see whole assemblies? Um, so imagine I'm at a high school, typically we bring the whole school into the gym for an assembly. Um, assuming everyone's there, they're wearing masks. Some are vaccinated, some are not. That's what we're waiting for the school guidance. We do not have um, clarity yet from the state or even from the CDC, because um, the CDC would still say stay six feet apart. Uh, at right now, I just went to the, the CDC itself hasn't updated its website for the next school year. So we are still looking at in the school environment, 
um, requirements around distancing that would make those type of events not possible today. We do anticipate that will be relaxed as we move it. If we have a successful summer, uh, we anticipate, and we I'm anticipating a successful summer in Marin County, especially because of our high vaccination rates. And, um, and so we expect there'll be some relaxation in the CDC recommendations, but we need to be prepared that there will be a difference between primary and secondary school, where um, what we've seen, some of the language we've seen is if a certain percentage of a school is fully vaccinated, um, there might be more relaxations and that will only be attainable in a secondary school environment. So. Okay, so several, several questions are coming in about distancing outside, you know, et cetera. And just to note, meals outside, meals outside activities, we actually don't have the information yet. And so that will continue to evolve in the next period of time. So we will, you know, keep this sort of up to date. Questions about uh, adults who are fully vaccinated, having to wear masks, the answer now in, in terms of work is a yes, but we're waiting for Cal OSHA. We're spo they're supposed to have a meeting tomorrow that might help guide um, some of that, but we don't have that information um, yet as well. So there's definitely areas we don't have uh, the answers yet, but it'll be evolving and um, we'll, we'll continue to keep people up to date. Lisa, let's go on to the next slide about air quality and then we can get back to the question. Oh, I, I added more. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we, don't be, we, we don't have too much more to go. Not, not too many more slides. Oh, no, it's great. We just wanted to encourage people to think about their the families with younger children. Um, it's close to my heart because I have a 10, almost an 11 and nine year old the next month. Uh, so really because your, your kids under 12 are unvaccinated, really limiting the time indoors in public settings and striving to avoid crowds and confined spaces. Um, your children may, because they're unvaccinated, may pose a, a risk to others and they would be more likely again to um, be, contract COVID-19 because they are unvaccinated and indoor settings are at higher risk. Um, wear a mask when indoors and in public and when around other households. And I know this will just be a family choice around um, when you mix households together. Uh, if it, it's mixed households that are un, un, with unvaccinated children, it would still be recommended that you wear um, the unvaccinated kids wear masks when they are indoors and take the mask off when they're outdoors. Just optimizing that time outside and that's when the, the kids can take their masks off. And then um, when staff are outside, the staff can also take their masks off. Um, I believe that's, a, that's, there's some, this, that's the discrepancy between the state law and Cal OSHA, but that is the state law is when you're outside, you don't have to wear a mask. Um, symptomatic, and this is really key. A lot of people are finally going to travel. Um, so we are recommending test symptomatic testing, like I mentioned before. So any, anyone that has symptoms of COVID-19, don't hesitate, get tested. Um, don't proceed as normal, get tested, get tested, get tested. And then just remember if you have children, unvaccinated ch children under 12, we still have our testing and quarantine requirements. So to return to school. So really planning for the end of the summer, especially um, if you travel out of state and you, right now, if you travel out of state and return in August, you will need to quarantine your unvaccinated children for seven days. Um, that would be the shortest amount they would have to quarantine. You'd be able to have the shorter amount of quarantine if they test negative for COVID on day five. So just um, really to have that in the back of your head as you're planning the travel. We want every kid to start school on that first day of school in person. And so you're gonna probably have to look at the calendar and count backwards seven days, which I had to do myself. Uh, jump ahead. I just wanted to have a note around just the mental health and well-being of our kids. If you think about uh, childhood development, 15 months is a really long time in a child's development. Think of your 15-month-old and how different they were at three years old. And that's the case with um, all children and adolescents. They are, it's a significant um, time of emotional for emotional development, intellectual development. And so what we are seeing now is that everyone was hunkered down in survival mode. Um, for 15 months. And now is when people are starting to present with more fear, worry, and anxiety. So just stay in touch with your kids, check in on your kids, talk to your kids. Um, don't be surprised if they're acting out or having trouble interacting with other kids as they go um, into a new camp environment and um, or a, a new youth activity environment. They, they might, it might be a little bit awkward and they're gonna need your help to navigate their emotions and navigate um, building so, social connections because it's been an awkward 15 months and it was awkward for adults and it can be even more awkward for kids. So just really checking in on your kids. And then 
um, plan trips with your with your family and build time outdoors with your family. That what's ahead of many of us is like, well, we're going to get back to work as just like normal. And it's again, a critical time just to focus on the your family's overall health and well-being. And I just have the number to our access access line. This, the county has an access line if anyone needs any mental health um, referrals. Of course, talk to your providers if you have any concerns about your child. But the county also does have um, a, an access line for families who might need to get connected to resources. Um, and that's Angel Island. I took my kids there to Angel Island. It was just an awesome trip. And um, so air quality, you want to launch on the air quality, Mary Jane? And yes, yes, sure. So just as a reminder, um, one of the things that we are uh, prepared for and have anticipated is uh, in the event that we find ourselves in situations with poor air quality, this information is available on the um, Rethinking Schools website. The school districts all have this information as do our uh, private independent parochial partners. But just as a reminder, so that people are aware of you know, what the steps will be, um, the plan um, is that schools will be open, right? Air regardless of what the air quality is, this will not be a situation that schools will be closed. Um, and so um, many of our schools, as you know, have air, air purifiers in place and we are able to um, essentially, if there's bad air, there's bad air everywhere, but we've been able to give even more information here um, related to uh, where the data comes from um, in terms of air quality and that we will, and that's um, airnow, airnow.gov and we're working, you know, working very closely with Dr. Willis and Dr. Santora um, in the event you know, that we do have poor air quality, but we can, I think, anticipate given what we've seen in the last um, uh, several years that this will be data that we'll need to um, uh, be attentive to and it provides you what kinds of activities um, would require us to have our students um, potentially not be outside, but rather be inside uh, during bad air. Lisa, what would you add to that? Um, just to piggyback onto that is if you look at the purple tier is that we will be recommending that children and students um, do not spend time outdoors when we are in the purple level. And we know that that is when, when kids are outdoors, that's when they can kind of get the wiggles out or just, you know, kind of decompress after sitting in a classroom all day. So what we'll be looking at, and it'll depend on the rates of COVID-19, is what would be allowable indoors. And based on if there's low prevalence of the disease, we might you know, encourage you know, aerobic activity, wearing masks indoors, um, um, just because of we know there's low prevalence of COVID-19 and just making sure that kids have some, some, some physical activity as they're navigating a school day where they're not out, allowed to go outdoors and they're, in, and they're inside all day. So it really will be based on both the vaccination rates and the, and the prevalence of COVID-19, what recommendations we would make to support um, students staying indoors all day at school when we're experiencing poor air quality. So it'll just be more to follow and we'll, we would convene a meeting with our school leadership um, based on um, a purple day just to to provide that information based on the, the COVID-19 activity that's currently in, ongoing in the community at that time. Hopefully not much because hopefully we've continued to vaccinate um, more individuals across the county and the, we'll have very low rates of COVID-19 is my hope. That's it. You're okay. Done. One more thing. I had, oh, I had okay. one more slide. One more slide from me. Okay, got it. So uh, it's a, a few of us in the county got to experience our first um, couple of power outages. I had two power outages uh, a week and a half ago. So this is really a reminder as we talk about poor air quality um, to dare to prepare. Um, go to our amazing website, readymarin.org, has tons of resources. Your kids have grown. Um, you may have grown 19 pounds from COVID too. Um, so check your, your evacuation backpacks, make sure your clothes fit and you have all the batteries still work and the water is not very old. Um, review your family communication plan um, with your children. Um, they might have phones themselves because they've grown up and got a cell phone. Um, make sure that they are, everyone knows where to meet and gather and how to communicate in an emergency. Um, and then sign up for our alert systems. And we have um, the alert systems in Spanish as well, um, both for Nixel and um, Alerta Marin. So um, sign up and get prepared because tis the season. Now I'm done. 
Okay, Lisa, thank you. All right, I'm gonna start with the questions that were asked uh, prior uh, to, the, um, to this session, the questions that came in. Um, so I just want you to clarify one more time, vaccinated teachers, do they have to wear a face covering? Can it be optional? And no. Think, no. So the answer is in, indoors, we will all be wearing face coverings based on what we know at this moment. Yes, and right? that may change tomorrow. Um, we are waiting to see what Cal OSHA and the governor says. So mm -hmm. all employees who work in California are following November 2020 rules where it comes to face coverings indoors and outdoors they are allowed, um, they do not need to wear their face covering. Great. Okay, well parents need to be vaccinated to attend events on campus in the fall. No, they do not need to be vaccinated to attend events. Our recommendation is around parents who are volunteers on campus. Anyone that has direct contact with students uh, should be vaccinated. It's not an order. Vaccination is voluntary, but to have close contact and to engage um, with, with our students, public health is recommending um, they be vaccinated. Um, county that employees though are not required to be vaccinated. It's, it's voluntary. It's for the non um, the non-essential visitors to the campus who work with kids are, it's recommended that they should be vaccinated. So Lisa, let's just follow on that. Um, let's assume an employee um, of, a, of whoever, of a school district or a um, nursing home, let's say, is interacting with vulnerable, uh, medically fragile people um, and is um, uh, unwilling as opposed to unable to be vaccinated. Um, how is it that you can imagine we'll be resolving things like that? Will there be a, a testing cadence we'd be looking at? Yes, so we would anticipate, and this is something we'll be working on with the state over the summer and piloting in the schools that are in session is a testing cadence where um, it is possible that there could be a week for unvaccinated individuals who work with vulnerable populations, there could be a weekly testing cadence. Testing once a month is not a way a strategy to identify cases among an unvaccinated population. As I mentioned, people can be asymptomatic or symptomatic with COVID-19. So the testing cadences that are, um, the minimal testing cadence is often a weekly testing cadence. And that's what we'll be um, exploring this summer as we um, partner with the state at looking at testing strategies. We're not looking at universal testing. It would be for select populations like unvaccinated individuals and also having readiness um, to test um, schools when there is a potential outbreak like I described earlier. Mm -hmm. So do you see a time when um, the state will require vaccinations of adults or students? No, okay. I don't see the state requiring that. Uh -huh. um, I see employers requiring vaccination. We are, already saw in um, a hospital in Texas, um, they, the, their, I forget what circuit of the court upheld vaccination that it, they could require vaccination at, of their staff to be employees of these vulnerable locations. So I see employers being allowed to require vaccination. We will look at our data. We, we issue a mandatory flu vaccination order every year for um, nursing homes and healthcare workers. And this is something that we will uh, look at um, as we move into the fall for, for those vulnerable populations. I do not anticipate there'll be an order for school staff though from Marin County Public Health, but there may be schools, this school districts, private schools who may choose to make vaccination a requirement. And at this point it appears um, that is being upheld as a right of those employers to require a requirement, re require vaccination. Okay. But I do not see a state order or a county order for schools. So Lisa, to clarify, so right now, um, is there any, are there any distancing requirements uh, that are in play either in school, in school, for example, six foot di di distance between desk, et cetera? The, the three foot distancing between desk is still a requirement. Um, so that has not changed yet. And that's what we'll be waiting, waiting to see from um, from the updates that come from both the Centers for Disease Control and from the state. So what we're anticipating is the CDC will make their update to their school, school guidance. I don't know when that's coming. And then CDPH will then review those updates and determine if they just wanna to refer to Centers for Disease Control guidance or if they want to um, provide more specific um, or strict 
guidance for the uh, state. So that's, but at this time, desks still need to be three feet apart in the school setting. So in, at a, in a school setting right now that's operating summer school, multiple classes, elementary level, students are unvaccinated um, and they're wearing no masking outside. Are they able to mix classes on the playground at this point? Yes, but they, yes. Okay, so students can mix on the playground and we know that they will not be wearing masks or, or facial coverings. Um, okay, can you, know, you need to know who's out on the playground because if someone does test, the more mixing that happens, the more work will happen when someone tests positive. And the more that's because a playground is a great example where we wouldn't, unless you can assert that, affirm that everyone has stayed six feet apart since kids are unmasked on a playground. And I, I, it's very doubtful that any school could affirm that 100% kids were six feet apart and there's never any close contact. We would have to treat that whole group as an exposed group and then quarantine them if there's a positive. So there's still significant benefits in um, controlling group size and tracking groups as we, especially when we're um, with unvaccinated groups of that under 12 population, because we could have to consider everyone on that playground then exposed um, if there's a positive case on a playground. Um, Lisa, here's a question. Isn't herd immunity already met in Marin County? Well, no, because we're still having cases. <laughs> so um, we have, they, they've said 75, so theoretically 70, once, the, once you've hit the 75%, you've achieved protection, herd immunity. That doesn't mean everyone is immune and COVID-19 can't be transmitted. The first slide I showed you, it shows evidence of community immunity. We don't have any hospitalizations. Um, we're having significantly lower case rates of the disease, which all suggests that we have a level of community immunity um, or herd immunity. But again, we're still seeing people get infected with COVID-19 every day. And we are, um, and we're seeing individuals even who are vaccinated. Um, we've had, I think we're over 70 cases of, of breakthrough cases, people who've been vaccinated, who um, have developed COVID-19. Fortunately, they've not required hospitalizations and not have had severe illness. And that's very reassuring, but um, herd immunity, again, it's not a force field around our community. We still are in the middle of a pandemic where um, we, have no, we, we have some borders with other countries, um, but we have to be aware there's constant movement, population movements from populations of lower vac significantly lower vaccination rates um, we just, the California local health officers just wrote a letter to the governor recommending our supply of vaccine go down to Central America and our, our neighboring um, countries to the south where we have very low vaccination rates um, in Guatemala and El Salvador, um, a little bit higher in Mexico. And we are, we still remain vulnerable, especially when, um, again, just the description of the outbreak and seeing how that Delta variant behaved in Marin County, how we never had an outbreak that big. Um, it's one of our largest, um, well, we have. We have had an outbreak that big, but that's one of our, our it's our largest in a youth population. Mm -hmm. so. Lisa, the concern about the um, effect, and I'm gonna not pronounce this correctly, but myocarditis, is that the right? Myocarditis. Word? Okay, um, how, so here's the question. There's a concern about that. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then the question is, um, how can we recommend that, that children get vaccinated given uh, the concern about myo myocarditis? Myocarditis. So myocarditis okay. is inflammation of the heart. And the centers for, we have one to start off first, we have one of the, the greatest surveillance systems in the world around adverse events as it relates to vaccines. And so we have in Marin County, for example, we have um, Marin County Public Health has submitted around 50 um, incident reports to the CDC and um, FDA around vaccine adverse events. There is no medication, no vaccination that does not come without a risk of adverse events. Unfortunately, most adverse events are extremely rare. So if you just think about the numbers of individuals who've been vaccinated in Marin County, over 200,000, for 200,000 individuals that have been vaccinated, we have reported um, 50, 50 adverse events. Most of them are very, um, are self-limited or mild um, adverse events like um, 
uh, not a vasovagal event, but a, an allergic reaction, a, a, a mild allergic reaction. Um, but again, it's any medication, anything foreign that enters in your body comes with risks. Um, that's why there's this rigorous process with the CDC and FDA to review the safety and efficacy of these vaccines to determine that the benefits of the vaccination outweighs the risk of the vaccination itself. And again, this is a voluntary decision for families and adults um, to make, um, parents and guardians and adults to make around um, getting vaccinated. And we have been very fortunate in Marin County that the majority of residents are choosing to vac get vaccinated. That being said, um, we are we're very closely following. We have great partnerships at UCSF Benioff Children's and have been very closely following the, um, both the local and regional incidence of myocarditis, which is inflammation of um, the heart. It appears nationwide, it occurs in 0.00015 um, of the individuals um, who have been vaccinated. So it's a very rare, extremely rare event appears to happen in younger males. Um, so it's a rare event that appears to be happening in younger males and the CDC will be meeting again to review additional data from these VAERS reports to determine if it's gonna affect their recommendation, which I suspect it will not. I describe a very low rate of myocarditis in individuals who are infected with COVID-19, the rate of myocarditis is between seven to 20% of individuals who are infected with um, COVID-19. And so the other point is that in the cases of myocarditis have been found, it's bound to it seem to be a, a, a self-limited, so not lasting long um, case of myocarditis. And this is not in, in no way, I'm, I'm a mom of a young boy, in no way do I want to discount the fear or worry of a mom who has a child who may have developed um, vaccine-related myocarditis. Um, what that feels like. I, I know what it would feel like for myself. Um, but it's it, it, the cases that have been studied appear to be very self-limited, mild cases of myocarditis that are, is treated basically with anti-inflammatory medication. So not requiring hospitalizations, requiring assessment and evaluation, but not severe disease. And, and so at, at this point, the benefits for our total population of adolescents because um, we have had increasing um, cases of hospitalizations of adolescents in the past couple of months due to COVID-19. Um, the benefits at this time continue to outweigh the risk. But again, I, this is why it's a voluntary vaccination. It is um, it's a decision parents make informed decisions around getting vaccination. And um, we have encouraged parents who um, so we have our mass vaccination strategies where you're ready to go and you get vaccinated. We also encourage um, parents who need more information um, to talk, not, not to get vaccinated at our public health vaccination clinics, but to talk to their healthcare providers first and decide if vaccination is best for um, their children who are eligible for vaccination. Any information on whether we will be required to get boosters? No. Uh, at this point, no, it's, it's another thing we're going to be seeing over the summer, the behaviors of variants and how our immune system holds up. Fortunately, after vaccination, we're seeing um, <clears throat> last for more than a year in many cases, even though I've described breakthrough cases. And that's where everyone is different. Some people have very you know, strong immune response to a, a vaccination and it's last forever and then some people will remember that they were vaccinated against hepatitis b and they never got the antibodies and had to go through another series of vaccination every individual immune system is very different um, at this point the data is not suggesting that the fall will have boosters and because um, we've not determined what would be the percent of what we call the incremental um, benefit or addition of more immunity um, for someone who has been um, someone after they've received vaccination so at this point, no, but we'll, we always are closely following um, the science to determine what our what the public health recommendations will be. Lisa, and just that one more thing is that the variant that I described, um, the United Kingdom National Health Service did a study on the um, Pfizer vaccination and the effectiveness against that variant, the Delta variant, and they found that it's 90% 90, 90 effective. Um, so that's why, again, we didn't, we saw this, these, we're seeing kind of very short limited outbreaks because in our community, there are so many people that are vaccinated that it doesn't take long for the, for the virus to just find too many vaccinated people that it can't transmit and, and keep circulating through our community. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, just to clarify one more time, uh, 
The, does the Cal OSHA um, information we're waiting for affect adults being able to be outside unmasked at a school? It, the adult can be unmasked outdoors at a school, but more that needs to be more than six feet away from the, the kids. Okay. Okay. Um, Ken, can you help with the questions? I feel like I'm good with the chat. Sure. Um, and we, and no. we need to stop in five five minutes because I have a video to show. So go. Okay, Ken, I'm going to bundle a few here. Um, they have to do, these all have to do with the process um, for when a student may test positive. Are schools still going to be going through the process of contact tracing, of quarantine the student, if so, how long, or of quarantine cohorts? Absolutely. So this is where we still have our public health and safety liaisons. We are still, we still are notified of every positive case at the county. As I've mentioned previously, usually the parents find out if the child is positive before we are. Um, so they are to contact the school. Um, the schools will contact our team, will identify what was the infectious period of the child or the staff who tested positive and determine if they were on campus during their infectious period. If they, um, we then would identify the close contacts of, um, the child, of the child or student, and then they would be placed um, on a seven day um, quarantine after, from the point of the last known exposure to um, COVID-19. The exception is though we have an increasing number of students who are fully vaccinated. And so if you're fully vaccinated, um, you do not need to be placed on a quarantine. And so that's another great benefit of vaccinating our adolescent population is there will be less um, interruptions um, to the school year because of um, ordered quarantine. Remember that's one of the, that is the last remaining order in our county is the isolation and quarantine order. So if you, unlike with the, like with the flu, when you guys get the flu, there's not a mandatory order that you stay home and isolate and quarantine. With COVID-19, there's still, you should still stay home and isolate um, until you're asymptomatic. Um, but, um, but with COVID-19, we do have those mandatory orders for isolation and quarantine. A lot of questions about eating lunch. Um, can students eat indoors? at lunchtime and regarding outside, is any distancing needed for eating lunch outdoors? You would, if it's a school, so if it's a school environment or a licensed childcare setting, they still need to follow the rules of um, the distancing rules for that are in the state guidance. So those are still in effect and eating is, is it's, you should attempt if kids are eating to have it, if possible, if practicable, our favorite phrase, if practical, maintain a distance of six feet. Um, eating is a higher risk exposure, especially when it's indoors. So we recommend everyone try and eat outdoors. If they have to eat indoors, which is possible, um, try and maximize physical distancing. You may not be able to get, may not be practicable to achieve six feet, but try and have physical distancing. And then um, try just a limited amount of time uh, that kids are um, just eating. They shouldn't have a, a luxurious lingering lunch. They should um, have a perfunctory 15 minute lunch. And they're pretty good at that anyway. Yeah, they want to get out. But. Regarding, regarding um, mask requirements, is any thought been given at any level to separating K-12 so that the older students, seventh through 12th, for example, that are eligible for vaccinations would not have the same requirements as the younger kids? That's what we're expecting to see from Centers for Disease Control is a differentiation between primary schools and secondary schools. It's not been done yet. Um, we've seen language where um, it's identified 70% as that threshold, um, but it'll be interesting to see because remember the schools will still be operating under um, Cal OSHA requirements um, too. So that's what we're, we're waiting to see how they align. But it is, po it is pro I would say it's probable that there'll be a distinction between a secondary, the masking requirements requirements for a secondary school um, versus or vaccinated um, among vaccinated students and non-vaccinated um, students. So I, I'm anticipating that. And the reason I'm anticipating that is because that's what we saw in the Centers for Disease Control um, update on camps. That um, summer campers who are fully vaccinated do not need to wear their mask indoors. So that's what suggests to me that that's the direction both the state um, and the CDC will head in for head towards for schools. But I think this is where it's just watchful waiting to watch how this um, virus behaves in our country. We're all part of a research project to see what happens as um, 
states across the nation now have relaxed um, relaxed their uh, restrictions and travel will be at a peak in the summer. So we'll have a lot more travel and see how the virus behaves. But that's the indicate that's the direction we think they're going. Okay, Lisa, I'm gonna give you the last word after we watch this video. So if everybody could take a moment, you'll be able to find this video on the Rethinking Schools website to share with others. And if you could sit back and just enjoy the fact that we're recognizing what a good job you've all done. So to all of you, good job, great job, actually. We're so appreciative. Um, Lisa, for all the partnership, all the steps along this path, please know how much we appreciate uh, you and Matt being available to us each and every step of the way. There's no way that we would be where we are. So good job to you. And Lisa, you can have the last word. Well, I just, well, I just wanna thank Mary Jane Burke, you're my hero and the Rethinking Schools team and our public health schools team. I am, like I said, when we started, I, this is my proudest achievement is opening schools for our kids. And we led with making sure it was the safest possible environment for teachers and staff, and most importantly, led with our kids and what was best for our kids. And uh, I, I wanted to, every kid back in school five days a week from the beginning. Um, that was impossible in the beginning. Um, and as frustrated as some of it, us may have been, if you look at the counties around us and the states around us, their kids didn't get back to school. So um, I'm just so grateful to everyone on these calls. Um, your engagement in this process and listening is part of our success too. And so I'm just you're all my heroes and we did a good job. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be a better job next year because we're gonna start in school. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be in school that first day of school if they don't, if they're not on quarantine after traveling. <laughs> so, okay, thank you all. thanks so much. Happy summer to everyone. Thanks for everything. We appreciate it.